Good evening. Welcome to the Hopkinton School Committee meeting for Thursday, October 3rd, 2019. I'd like to call the meeting to order and request all those present and willing to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd also like everyone to know that Professor Tyler is unable to join us today because she had to be at a conference. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Um, there were members of public who had expressed that they would probably be here, but looks like we'll move on and we'll have another opportunity at the end of the meeting in case someone is able to join at that time. The next item on the agenda is recognition. Um, there is something that I would like to call out. Uh, I would like to recognize Dr. Kavanaugh, Mr. Ashok Ghosh, uh, the school administrative leaders and staff, and also Chief Lee, Deputy Chief Bennett, and all members of the law enforcement who worked swiftly under tremendous pressure to ensure safety of children, staff, and all members of the HPS community. A sincere gratitude to you. Thank you. I would also like to extend my Gratitude to the police department. They were amazing in their response last week and, um, and things worked out very well, so thank you. Anyone else would like to add anything? Thank you. Moving on, the next item on the agenda reports from the school council. Are we not expecting any tonight? I guess not, no. Maybe we should reach out to them and see if they're coming back to us. Okay, that's great. They always enjoy them. So it looks like we are 12 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Um, so moving on to uh, Ms. Parson, Assistant Superintendent's report on MCAS. I'll fix the 12 minutes for you. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for indulging a few minutes in an MCAS overview tonight. And um, I know that you've already seen the slides, and I just wanted to reiterate there are a small number of slides, and the reason for that is this is really a very broad 30,000-foot overview of the MCAS. And um, the way that we look at MCAS and really the multitude of data points that we have to review from that, it's, it's really an ongoing process, and we really engage in that process from the moment that we've received our information, which was over the past couple of weeks, um, through the next administration of the MCAS, which will begin um, actually at the high school. They start their retake cycle in the fall, and then we move into the spring with everybody else. Um, but in terms of the things that we look at overall with the MCAS, um, there are so many things that we can delve into. We look at student achievement. We look at student growth. Um, we look at students who um, have met kind of cut scores individually. We look at grade levels. We look at content areas. Um, we look at different cohorts and subgroups, and a lot of that is really driven by um, how DESE shares information with us and um, how they've set up the system. And I think, as we all know, and I talked about this a little bit last year, the system has really changed. And what um, MCAS talks about a lot now is accountability. And a accountability combined with growth and achievement, and growth and achievement are part, are part of kind of this whole myriad of data points and information sets that we use um, to really assess where we are. Um, so when we look at this first slide, um, it's just really a, a very basic definition of what is an accountability system. And, you know, at the end of the day, it answers the questions, how is the school doing, and what kind of supports do our schools need? And, you know, back in the day, MCAS was really, really a measure of how are we doing with our instruction. And it's really grown and expanded into so many different areas. Uh, and really, a lot of that is reflective of who our students are and who our population is reflective of. So you'll see that we have lots of different subgroups that we look at. Um, we certainly care um, tremendously about our students' achievement. Uh, for many of us, especially our teachers, we really look at student progress and growth. And we know that all students start in different places, and our job is to move them forward from where they start um, as dramatically and effectively as we can. Um, we look at things like high school completion, um, how our ELL students are doing, um, and a number of other factors um, that DESE has asked us to look at. 
In that bottom right hand box, what is really on the minds of a lot of educators now is looking at our lowest performing students. And the way that a lot of our data is calculated is looking at our entire cohort of students and then factored in to the way DeciMath does it, um, our lowest performing 25% of our students are added into our calculations in terms of our progress very heavily. Almost 50% of our um, scores come from both our general cohort and then added in our, our lowest, um, lowest growth cohort. Um, which really focus us, forces us, especially in a district like a Hopkinton where we can look at the aggregate and say, yeah, we're doing great. Um, but it really forces a high performing district like ours to really dig in and see where are the areas where we may not be meeting the target and are there students that we're missing, what are we missing and what are we going to do about it. So these are just some of the um, descriptors of the accountability system, um, some of the things that I just talked about. So. You'll see as I move on that, um, you know, achievement is our scores in ELA, math and science. Um, student growth is reflected at every grade except for third grade because that calculates where were the students the year before and where are they now with the exception of fifth grade science because that's the first exposure that they have to that assessment. Um, chronic absenteeism, I'll just say up front, you know, as you saw some of the slides, I believe I repeated that when we kind of look at some of the considerations for every grade level, every school, um, it's there. It's something that we have to look at and think about. And there are many factors that um, go into that when a student misses 10% of the days out of their school year. And some of them are very, very legitimate. There's illnesses, you know, it, and it doesn't matter to Desi. It doesn't matter for this category of chronic absenteeism. Is it an excused absence, an unexcused as absence? It's, it's days they're not there sitting in front of a teacher. Um, so that's, that's something else that obviously we need to think about and look at. Um, advanced coursework, which we have plenty of in Hopkinton, um, again, deals with our 11th and 12th graders. It's not just AP classes. It's a whole host of classes are calculated into that um, category in terms of classes that DESE considers 11th and 12th graders taking that are above the norm um, in terms of rigor. So in terms of where we are in Hopkinton, just again a broad overview, um, you know, they used to give us these numeric levels. Now, at least for the next couple of years, we're getting this just kind of general tagline, do you need assistance and intervention or don't you? And Hopkinton, no surprise to any of us, does not need assistance or intervention. Um, certainly we need reflection and, you know, digging in and reviewing, uh, but we are meeting or exceeding our targets overall in Hopkinton, which I think is no surprise to any of us. Um, so what do we do next? We start delving into the data. We meet by school. So school principals at this point in time, we have five principals. They're in five different places of data review, um, but we work collaboratively. They work with their faculty members. Um, and as I said, there are so many reports from, you know, what, what the actual items were on the test, which ones we got right, what percentage we got right, what standards do those questions connect to, um, our subgroup performances, et cetera. Um, so we then start looking at making those connections from student performance to what we're teaching and how we're teaching it. Um, and then we dig down even deeper into the individual students and figure out what it is we need, we need to do to meet our students. Uh, where they are. Um, the other thing is that we do is look at patterns and trends. So is there something that we've seen year after year? So you know, you see this happen a lot in math when there'll be just one topic that they didn't get to before MCAS because we teach that at the end of May and the MCAS is given before that. So we're constantly looking for ways that we can ensure that um, content is addressed before the MCAS. And we also do all that while we try to make sure that we're not teaching to the test and we're not, you know, singularly focused on the MCAS. So what I did, um, just to kind of give you the rationale for how I put this together, and I'm, I don't know how to fix that really to make it look better, so I apologize. Um, it's me. But well, you, you, you've seen it, so I think it's, and I'll just speak to it. Um, so I tried to look at, you know, what are the things that overall looked really great at first glance, and what are the things that at first glance said, um, hold on a minute, you need to kind of look at this and figure out um, what's happening here and take another look. So in terms of the thing that, things that have appeared to go really well at Elmwood, um, when we look at our achievement, which is just straightforward, how, how the kids do on the questions that they were asked, um, 
Elmwood School has done really, really well. They've earned all of the available points for achievement in grade three. And um, I will give credit to that school, um, to Ann Carver, and last year was Aiden, and our curriculum leaders and our classroom teachers, Deb Moriarty, who's now our new ELA um, director. They worked tirelessly on really resetting in, um, expectations for ELA and making sure that what was happening instructionally was happening. Uh, when we look at um, we, the next part in terms of the DESE's performance criteria, um, and when we look at some of our subgroups, our ELL students exceeded their achievement targets in ELA and math, um, and they met their targets for acquiring English proficiency. Um, you won't see scores like that in all of our schools because of the size of the subgroup. So the cohort of L's at Elmwood was 24. You have to have at least 20, and the other schools just were not there yet um, in terms of having the right number of students to report out on. But I think we all know that that will change um, as students move up through the grades. Um, the other thing that we were really looking at at Elmwood um, in a really positive light was a lot of attention on the math standards last year. So with the implementation of a new math curriculum, um, really paying attention to just right activities and learning tasks with the standards, um, most of our subgroups exceeded their achievement targets in math at Elmwood. Um, in terms of things that we really want to take a look at at Elmwood overall, um, our students with disabilities subgroup did not meet their achievement target. Um, while the aggregate and four other subgroups did either exceed or meet their targets. So we want to take a look and see who is that cohort of students and what can we do to support them moving forward. And what can we, and it's the tricky thing, you know, because you work with it. Once you look at a cohort, now they moved on. So those third graders are now Hopkins, fourth graders. So, you know, we have to look at, from the Elmwood perspective, we're looking <laughs> at students and who they were and what we anticipated in terms of what their progress would look like. And we also have to look at what patterns do we see and how can we apply what we learned from last year's third graders to this year's class of third graders. So moving on to Hopkins and the aggregate, we've earned almost um, all of the available points for achievement and nearly all of the points for growth. Um, Hopkins School has had an incredible building-wide focus on curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, and you can really see that in the students' performance. There's been shifts in the way that Mrs. Bellello has her teams working. Um, she's really changed some of the focus areas of her teachers. There's a lot more PLC work going on at grades four and five. And because of that, they had a lot of um, very sustained um, working time to really dig into their curriculum last year. And looking at our overall progress um, of Hopkins, our achievement towards the targets increased by 7% um, last year which is significant. Um, the high needs subgroup demonstrated significant improvement in achievement and growth um, from 1819. Um, and the lowest performing 25% of the students earned almost all of the points um, that comprise their accountability, meaning that some of our more um, fragile learners really um, did well and had the right types of supports and instruction at Hopkins. Um, and nearly all of our subgroups either met or exceeded the growth um, target that was set forth. So at Hopkins, the things that we want to think about are our economically disadvantaged students um, and students with disabilities who did not meet all of their growth targets, although many others did. Um, in math, our students with disabilities subgroup did not meet its target, um, although many others did. And the chronic absenteeism, which I think I talked about. Sorry, Jen. Students sure. with disabilities, are those students who have an IEP yes. or a 504 or, or both? Or did the 504s uh, get put into the students with disabilities number? I think it's just I thought it was just IEPs. the IEPs. Okay. For that. Yeah, I, I thought that as well, yeah. So for our middle school, um, I'd say maybe out of all of our schools, we saw the most significant um, improvement and growth at our middle school, which is very exciting. Um, I will say that uh, Mr. Keller, Dr. Zaleski, Dan Mazur, um, and all of the middle school teachers spent a lot of time last year looking at data and really digging into the MCAS data, really looking at some of our subgroup performances, and clearly when our progress towards our targets rose by 11% at the middle school, um, their work really did reap some rewards last year. Our high needs subgroup um, demonstrated significant improvement. Um, high needs is made up of ELL disabilities and economically disadvantaged, so it's a combination of a number of groups. Um, the aggregate and every subgroup at the middle school exceeded their achievement targets in ELA and math and either met or exceeded their growth targets in both of those subjects. 
um, high needs subgroup and Asian subgroup also exceeded their achievement target in science. Um, on the other hand, we do need to look at science as an area of consideration at the middle school um, because our aggregate and subgroup of white students did not meet the science achievement target um, while three others did. Uh, when we start to think about why, you know, what happened in, in eighth grade science last year, um, I don't know the answer to that right now. I do know that the next generation science standards were rolled out really um, in their infancy in terms of being addressed on the MCAS. Um, so the standards that are being assessed are new and the format of the test for science was new. So I think we have some work to do at the middle school in terms of really digging in and looking at what, were there just some units that were missed? I don't have that level of information yet, but that's certainly something that we need to look at. I'm sorry, the students only take science MCAS twice in their career, right? They take it in fifth and eighth and then again in high school. Okay. But in their and kind and of K to eight. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then at the high school, um, you know, again, and you know, I talked about where the high school is in terms of other high schools because I think that's kind of how we look at our high schools. Um, globally, when people look at MCAS in the paper, we're always looking at high school because high schools, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we um, may, you know, have a, a big piece of data that helps determine whether or not a student is going to have that high school diploma. So um, we're in the top 4% of high schools statewide. Um, we've met nearly all of our available points for ELA and math achievement. Uh, our aggregate in every subgroup exceeded all of our achievement targets and nearly all uh, in ELA and nearly all in math and science. So a lot of good things are happening instructionally. Um, in terms of a competency determination or a high school diploma, um, every high school student, with the exception of just you know one or two, has earned the score necessary to t to earn that diploma. Um, and in at very high percentages, our students met or exceeded expectations in ELA, math, and um, biology. And you know, I think with the high school, it's really important to note, and I'm sure you saw this when you looked at the results statewide yourself, the high school scores all shifted dramatically this year. It was a brand new test, kind of a whole brand new way of being at the high school, and I'll kind of show some information about that in one of the next slides. Um, but high schools overall look different. Um, so in terms of the things that we really want to think about, our progress towards our growth targets was slightly lower. Um, in ELA and math, so while our students were still really making high levels of achievement, some of those growth scores that we would have liked to see weren't um, exactly where we would have hoped. Um, and so that's an area that the high school is looking at to see who were the students where growth wasn't made the way we would have expected and how we can work to improve that. Um, last winter, looking at our student profiles, a lot of work was done. Um, specifically under the direction of Dr. Zaleski and some of our special ed teachers. Um, we brought in a consultant, Dr. Ilda King, who worked very closely with our student services um, staff and some of our gen ed teachers at the high school to really start looking at students um, who are not a grade level, who are struggling to meet the content and the rigor of the standards uh, based on some of the, the individual challenges that they're facing. And we talked about things like, how do you engage those students in writing? How do you take some of the classic um, literature that's being used in a high school Eng English class and make that accessible to students who are struggling readers? Uh, we also added in some assessment. Go ahead. Were you, did nope. you have a question? No. Nope. Oh, OK. Um, we added in some different assessments at the high school for some of our students and our special educators so they can really start again to look very carefully at their students and their current performance levels and work collaboratively with their general education counterparts to make the inclusive situations as productive as they can and to really target when students are in um, a more um, kind of a pullout situation to really target that specialized instruction. So. One thing that I just wanted to note about the high school, well, a couple of things. Um, one thing that we kind of, you know, we talked about getting dinged on things, and you know, when, when you have these, all these criteria and um, scores that were provided with. So one of the areas that um, we got kind of downgraded on was our participation rate in the MCAS at the high school. And that actually had an impact on the high school's overall rating. And what happens is, if students don't take the MCAS, there's kind of a serious um, numeric penalty that you pay for that. So it's very, very important at the high school level, not important at all levels, but at that level um, for students to take the exam. 
So in one or two cases, we have actually um, sent some appeals to the Department of Ed because you're able to do that, and we just actually got word tonight that one of the appeals that we filed um, was accepted by the Department of Ed. So for example, if you have a student who says, I'm not taking it, or you have a family who goes on a vacation and they just don't return, and they're, these strange things happen, and I think historically they haven't happened here, but that's why DESE has an appeal process. So we have um, one or two situations that we're working on with um, the Department of Ed to make sure that our scores are reflective of the work that we're doing with our students, um, certainly in encouraging them to take the test and um, do their best. And the other thing that showed up was a decline in the percentage of our students taking advanced coursework. And um, we're also looking at that and trying to dig in and figure out why did that, why does it look like that? Because we don't have any evidence in our high school that we have fewer kids taking advanced courses. In fact, I think in some cases we might wish that some kids would give themselves a break and not take as many advanced courses. Um, but that also, you know, there are some funny things that can happen with that too. So when we have courses that are entered into our data system, if our um, coding and things don't match exactly with the way DESE codes, um, sometimes we have a little disconnect with DESE. So um, it's not that we have fewer kids taking. And in some cases, I think we're, we're working to rectify any type of reporting. So we make sure that all that is accurate. Um, so this is just kind of an overall glance at, you know, where we are. Um, and, you know, as I said, we're in the top 4% of Massachusetts high schools. Um, some of the schools on this list are not traditional, um, you know, 9 to 12 public schools like we are. Um, but, you know, that's where we are. We're, we're in very, very good company with very, very high performing districts. And in science, we're in the top 5% of Massachusetts high schools. And again, you know, you can see where um, math and English 1919 and then math and English in 2018 you can see where you know some of the hundreds in 2018 turned into 90s and 91s or 88s or 89s um, and that truly reflects that that is the trend that's been happening with high schools and it reflects a shift in rigor of um, the high school MCAS. So in last year or maybe you could review um, how we phased in the new MCAS testing because last year was that one of the first years that the high school Mm -hmm. computer-based yes. test. So yes. maybe if you could just re review that for people watching, like, do all the schools now take it on the computer? And what, do we start in third grade, right, a couple yes. of years ago? Yes. So last year was the first year for the um, third grade, for sure, to take it electronically, and the high school to roll out um, all of the subjects electronically as well. Yeah, and that, it, it does... It, it is a shift. It's a shift for students um, to get used to what the formatting is and how to think about their text in a text box. It's, it is a shift. And certainly we do a lot of practicing to help students prepare for what it is that's to come. And especially for our high school kids, doing something electronically isn't really new news to them. And a lot of the work that they do in their classrooms with the number of devices that we have really does prepare them for this kind of um, uh, interaction. But the first time you go through it is, it's the most challenging because it's, it's, it's the most different. Did the test format change too last year or is it just the mechanism by, for taking it? The test format has been changing over time. So there are more um, examples of paired texts that are in there for students and there's more kind of back and forth electronically. Um, and it's, it's a little bit cumbersome when kids go back and forth from the questions they're being asked to the actual text. Um, which might be a little bit different than how they've experienced text in their classrooms. Um, so yeah, I'd say it, it probably felt a little bit different to our students. I don't think it's unmanageable for them, but just different. I was just curious in terms of when we look at, when we look at trend data, like over yes. years, like is it reasonable to compare last year to the year before as apples to apples when it might be like apples to apple pie or, you know, something a little bit different. It's a little bit of a different animal, so... Yeah, I think um, as our students continue to move up, so now seventh, eight, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth have all had it this way. So as students become more familiar with what this really means and, and looks like, um, I think it'll be more fair to compare the trends. Ms. Parson, on this slide, when you say a hundred, what does that mean? That means um, a hundred percent of the students who took the test either met or exceeded the expectations. Um, so, 
so is that okay so 100 percent so yeah. that's a 12 percentage point shift for us yes in math and likewise for ELA right English. yes yeah and that's I don't I truly don't think that's a trend because this is really the first year that the high school has had this new version of the test so certainly we want to see that go up for next year sure. um, but it's it's very difficult and, and Desi will Department of Ed will tell you that you really can't compare when they make a significant shift in the test it's really difficult to compare one year to the next until you start getting kind of apples to apples which I think is what you asked earlier so one related question how much um, effort is made to acclimatize students to the shift either you know the method or the content itself you know it I think that really varies from classroom to classroom and content area to content area. And I think we really try um, in a district like ours to not teach to the test. So that means we don't want to spend a whole lot of time. Um, so if you're, you know, you're, you're teaching a rigorous class, you know what the standards are. Our teachers really want to be focusing on understanding the content versus understanding the format of a test. But that said, there is time spent going through and looking for patterns and figuring out what is it, what do we think was the answer to why students had some errors? Was it that they were unfamiliar and they need more time? At the younger levels, we might say, well, they kind of maybe they ran out of time because they're not used to keyboarding yet. Um, so, but it does vary in terms of how we're, I don't, I don't know that I could tell you that, and you might know the answer better than I do if we have a consistent uh, means of. It may have been two years ago when Desi did a demonstration of the scores for kids who took a paper-based test versus an electronic test. And overall, the kids who actually had the number two pencil and the piece of paper were about two to three percentage points higher. I think part, one of their, the reasons that they gave for that, they had said that um, if you're typing in a box, you have less awareness of how much text you've actually put in there. But if you're handwriting and they give you four blank pages, kids have an inclination to almost fill up those four blank pages. You know, so that was one of the things that they, they had suggested. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it is interesting to me that, and, and their take on it was that really kids produce something better when writing with the number two pencil on, on that test, but they'll never go back to it because the ease of having an electronic test is just so I mean if you're in a high school when the MCAS boxes come there are nine million of them and packing slips and, and tape and hundreds of tests and you're counting them all up and you're so afraid you've lost one and then they all have stickers with kids names on them and they all go to these different classrooms and now that's not a problem you know I mean there are other problems of course but did and every sorry, sorry. I, I uh, quickly I just want to clarify that I'm not advocating that we teach to the test Oh, I'm no, trying. I didn't think you were. I didn't think you were. You know what, I, Nina, it's, right. it's really balanced because you have to do some test preparation. You can't send your kids in and have them not familiar at all with the platform. Right. But you can't, you know, to your point, you can't spend the whole year doing test prep either. It's, it's definitely a fine balance. Thank you. Just one more question on this. Did every high school cut over last year or was there like a window? for? So if we, as we're looking at all of these high schools, is it fair to infer that all of these high schools cut over to the computer-based test last year, or was it a sort of a phase-in? And you could pick what year you phased in. Last year. Last year. So all these drops, many, of, many if not most, of these districts are seeing similar drops to ours. They're also all cutting over. OK. Yes. So, question on the chronic absenteeism, because that, um, that came as a surprise to me, because it, it, when you were saying the 10% of the days that that's a lot of school to have missed is that are we is that a trend that's shifted for us or have we always had that level of issue and it just hasn't come up because it wasn't counted in the same way in the MCAS well number one it's never been highlighted before okay the way that <laughs> um, I would say there are a number of things that could contribute to that so I think in some cases there were very legitimate illnesses of course there were concussions um, we've had some kind of very um, unusual, maybe student living arrangement situations where students are living between places. Yeah. Um, but we also have some family vacations. 
And, um, you know, I, I even remember as a principal when you would send that letter to a family and say, you know, your child has been absent for X number of days, a lot of times families would have no idea. And they would, it would come as a big surprise to them. But the letter comes, I think, at five days. It's either five or seven within a yeah, six-month period. Yeah, within seven days, yes. And some people either just haven't kept track or, um, you know, and then you say to them, well, the reason we're sending this to you is kind of as... Uh, just like a little flashing red light, like, please be aware. So the next time your child says, I'm really tired, I don't want to go to school today, maybe you'll encourage them to get to school today. Um, we've had some kind of anxiety-related mental health absences that have contributed. Um, so there, there's a whole smattering. We've had some cultural um, absences. So it's kind of all over the board. Um, but I do think we can do a better job of imparting the importance of school attendance to our families. Because if you can't, you know, and as a teacher, you know, you know, you hate to get that. We're going to be away. Are we going to miss anything? <laughs> no, 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 you're not going to miss anything. Right. The next two weeks, uh, we got nothing. <laughs> well, and I would think uh, the other side of that is students that are missing 18 days due to an illness or concussion or something, or, or more than that, we're, I assume, providing some kind of services for those. Well, we are. And so interestingly, um, I think that's another one of those kind of gray areas with the Department of Ed. So in some conversations that I've had with them, if you have a student who's on home tutoring, that can count as a student in school. So I actually need to go back. You, I don't know if you even know the answer to this, Carol, but I don't know that how we are counting those types of situations. But mm -hmm. it's something we want to go back and reflect on and make sure that we are um, counting things the way that we should. But this, is, this one category is a real bone of contention for all districts because a lot of people are really battling the same. You can do so much. And what I will say is that when I read this kind of appeal that the high school made regarding a student who um, was not there, when I read the description from the high school of every effort that was made to get that child to school and to encourage that child, it was, it was really extraordinary. So I think we do the best that we can. Um, we can always do better, but it's, it's an area to continue to examine. Um, I have a related question on absenteeism. So um, in terms of your ability to share some of this feedback at the state level with the Department of Education, that this is not seeming right, or these are some of the challenges that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. How much are you able to, do you have any forum, any opportunity to share that? I can tell you personally that I've shared it more than once. <laughs> and there aren't, respectfully, there are not great answers that we receive when we share those things. So when you say, um, we're trying to, so we have a community where we have changing demographics. So if you give that as an example, and you say, we may have a number of families, and there are a lot of districts like ours where a family has to make a decision to leave the country for four weeks, for whatever reason. How can I, as you know, a school administrator, say to a family, you can't make that personal choice? It's real, And so when you go and you explain that, and everyone else in the room is going, oh my god, yeah, we have all of those same situations. Or when you're trying for a mental health situation to help the family get support and all of those things, but that child still can't make it through the door on any given day, um, we, we have tried many times to share that um, with the department. And I think their point is, kids still need to be in school. And I understand the other side of it is I do understand because there are, I'm sure, plenty of cases where it's abused and where schools could do a better job, but um, it's, it, it is information <coughs> we try to share. And I just want to add about, you know, you mentioned briefly about the cultural aspect, right? Um, my personal story, in, I've lived in the States for 17 years and my entire extended family is in India. I have not attended a single wedding in these 17 years of a cousin, of a nephew, of a niece. First, because you know it's not easy to travel back and forth in a short duration, um, but also it's expensive, mm -hmm. right? So there are many things to it. So you know, I think I've seen some parents make those choices every so often that they want to go attend a wedding, and they don't always line up in the summer. That's right. And they don't line up around the holidays. Um, that's, I think, also part of education, if you will, not in you know, a regular academic education, um, that relationships matter and how, how it all works out. So I don't know how um, there could be codes that are available in you know, the reasons for absent 
baptism, if those could be considered, especially with the changing uh, demographics that we are seeing in our district. And, you know, I think we have talked about, you know, some illnesses and sicknesses. If you have the flu, what do you do? Right? We are, we are not allowed to send the child to school until after, you know, the fever has subsided over 24 hours. So it's, it's difficult, um, but those are not always in your control. Yeah, one thing that, you know, for people who might be interested, on the DESE website, they show all the absenteeism data for every school district, and they even do it in sort of that granular way so that you can look at it by schools. You know, so when I first got here, I used to think, oh my goodness, we have a lot of absenteeism, and then you could look at different schools to see where it was most prevalent or least prevalent and try to figure out why. But if you consider that there are some districts around us who might be like us, then you might get a good picture of, you know, are we sort of level with them, or are we, you know, using up more absences, or are we, you know, in a better shape than they are in terms of absenteeism? So there's good data out there. Well, how does the absenteeism score, I you know you listed um, a number of indicators in the beginning of your presentation, and absenteeism is one of them. Like, would that then, if that were our only indicator that was off, say, mm -hmm. would that then bump us into a needs intervention category? Like, is the, th there's a binary category where we do not need intervention, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. Is that mostly based on achievement? I mean, how do those in all those other indicators, the advanced coursework, et cetera, play into needing intervention? It's really, I, I can't say that I think chronic absenteeism would move us into one of those categories, because I'd say in many cases, we got zero out of four for that. Okay. So I don't see that as the most significant. But where I could see us having a problem is if we start seeing a real decline. So when Desi sets targets for us, and if we start seeing a decline, especially in our lowest performing 25 students or our high need students, I think that's when um, we're going to start to see an impact because our absences or our challenges are going to be counted kind of double. Um, but I would say overwhelmingly it's the achievement and the growth. But it's all set on how, what did you look like last year? What do you look like this year? What target did Desi set for you? And where are you in terms of making progress towards that target? Um, the things on this next slide are really, you know, I don't think I have to explain all of them, you've seen them, but they're really just kind of to demonstrate that there are many, many things that we will be doing as a district, um, and I've kind of already articulated that to address, mm -hmm. celebrate, you know, we want to celebrate the things that we did really well. It's a really big and public measure, but we want to then, you know, dig right into the work and start looking at things where we can be better. Um, just quickly on the high needs students that you have listed pretty much in every school, yes. it looks like they're not meeting expectations. Is that a trend that, you know, you were talking about that that would be an area? Uh, and that depends. So when high needs is made up of students um, whose first language is not English or who are learning English, students with, who are economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities, when, those, when that category gets broken out, you can really see what is it really. In some cases, our L students are making great progress. In some areas, our students with disabilities haven't. So I don't think we can paint that with a broad brush. I think we have to physically look at each content area and each subgroup. I think one subgroup that um, you know is going to show up is, a, and, and the other challenge with some of those subgroups in Hopkinton, the subgroups are so small mm -hmm. that one or two students' scores can really make a significant impact on your percentages. Um, so I think those are the things that we really we want to keep looking at. But overall, no, I don't actually see that as a trend that those subgroups will be not doing as well as we hope that they would, because in some cases, um, we've seen them make great growth and achievement, and that's what, what I would expect to see continuing. That's great. Thank you. I, I think your next steps are very well listed, and looks like you have things planned. Thank you. We do. How to look at things. I mean, could I just say one? Sure. Um, I think, I, I guess my only um, two things to ask is that as you're looking at the data, uh, obviously with all the growth, um, we're keeping an eye on making sure that our performance is keeping pace with the growth because we're, you know, we're scrambling in many cases, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that our students are not, that are insulated from the growth that we're dealing with yeah. around them. So I think we're doing an excellent job. But as you, if w this is sort of a snapshot, we don't really see year on year. So as you're looking at the trend data, 
just um, if you could bring back to us any concerns you have about, as you're looking over the last three years or five years, if there are any trends that we need to know about, especially if we might think there's you know an opportunity or, or a need to invest because we're not getting the right things that we need for our students because of growth. I think we'd want to hear that. And the only other thing that I would ask is, um, we've talked a lot about different cohorts, and I've had a personal eye on um, gender performance. So I'm asking if, as you look at the data, particularly in um, some of the ELA areas, just making sure that the boys and girls cohort, which we used to talk about a lot with our girls performing in science and math, and then it kind of we sort of got everything kind of caught up, and then I think some of the boy performance in ELA in some grades was quite low. So I don't often hear people talking by gender, um, but I'm, my ear is out for that because I've been kind of watching it myself. So I ask you to just flag for us in the future if you see anything. Absolutely. Thank you. And I appreciate your first comment about other things that you could be supportive with in terms of budget that are directly connected to our work. Exactly. Yeah. That's really important. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you so Thank much, you. Ms. Parson. Yes, very nice job. Thank you. Moving uh, right along uh, to superintendent's report, Dr. Kavanaugh. Hmm. See, I thought we were going to get a movie there. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I classroom all the time. Can I watch that? like the colors. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking that I'm kind of centered in there, but there's there's still yeah, a little overflow fucking, on yeah. that tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have divided my superintendent's report this evening <coughs> into happenings in our school, just a little bit of budget information, and then an update on my goals, which will be pretty quick. So the happenings in our schools. Um, for this evening I kind of reached out to the people who are teaching in some of the sort of specialized disciplines so you'll see some art and PE wellness a little bit of steam um, so I reached out to Colleen Janino and Karen Reno and said what do you got going on and I was very surprised to learn how much they have going on uh, so the art department as you know has started to kind of wend its way into our steam programming so they've had their first steam inter interdisciplinary PD session um, they seem very excited about that they will be having their second induction into the National Art Honor Society. So the advisors, Christine Enos and Sarah Williams, are very excited about that. As you probably know, we did not used to have kindergarten art in this district, and we do now, which is really exciting for us as well. So our art teacher, Miss Lucy, has been having a great time working with her K students. They are uh, doing things like printing and working with scissors thus far. Uh, you'll see here, too, that there's a couple of schools, Elmwood and Hopkins, where they have infused a little bit of literacy into the art classroom. So at Elmwood, they participated in the International Dot Day, and I don't know how well you can read that little blurb over on the side, but the Dot is a, a Peter Reynolds book. Um, so there's the artwork that they created with that. They had some additional pictures with everyone's dots everywhere. It was really beautiful. I should have probably added that. Um, at Hopkins, they read what you do with an idea, and then they brainstormed the many ways that artists come up with their ideas and feed their ideas. Uh, two of our middle school art teachers, um, Catherine Brummett and jo Jessica Zwellinger, uh, have presented recently at RISD. We have two exciting new additions at the high school this semester. Um, Ms. Williams is running a new intro to art history course and Sterling Morell is running a drone photography club after school and on the next slide you're going to get to see an example of that drone photography and it is amazing. Um, and Mr. Morell and Mrs. Janina will be presenting at uh, MassQ and the session they're presenting is entitled Managing Early Finishers in the Project-Based Classroom. And there is the drone yeah. photograph. Is that not cool. amazing? Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Entitled Campus at Dusk. Okay. So that was a student did that? Student, yes. That's awesome. Student. Isn't that awesome? Okay. The color is phenomenal. Yeah. Are those, those are the turf fields down there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't that great? <laughs> Looking good. Yeah. You can see the others are tennis. Uh, Basketball. Right? Yeah. On the right. The yeah. yeah. Tennis coats there. It's so beautiful. Yeah. 
from PE Wellness. I don't know if you will remember, but at the end of last year, we discovered that the fitness center in the middle school was very run down. And when I say very, I mean that we were picking up equipment on the side of the road when people would put out treadmills, we'd be putting them in our fitness center. So we set aside some money and the fitness equipment has come in and it's, it's just great. Uh, I was over there the other day, took a look at it. The room is sort of entirely made over. It's inviting, the equipment's totally up to date and it's great for the kids who work with OT and PT as well. Um, um, Stacy Place has revised the grade six wellness curriculum and she has a focus now on building resiliency. Kristen Santos, also at HMS, is completing her certification program in yoga, and she has done an awful lot of work bringing yoga into the middle school PE curriculum. Uh, she will be offering a night of mindfulness and yoga to Hopkinton Middle School families so parents can enjoy the benefits of yoga with their children. Uh, Mrs. Ritu Kapoor is a parent and a yoga instruction, instructor, and she has been a guest instructor at the high school. And Karen Reno completed the certification program in whole being, being positive psychology, and she has already started to write a new curriculum at the high school. She's testing out some of what she's learned in her stress management classes. And on this slide here, you can see uh, the yoga and some of the work that they're doing with the resiliency curriculum. And I really love their acronym of Bounce Back. Mm -hmm. And down below, you get to see all of the new treadmills in place. That room did not look like that in the <laughs> spring. So mm -hmm. that is a great facelift. Uh, thank you to Mrs. Lachansky and Mr. Scott. They, as part of the uh, STEAM grant uh, brought 30 kids to Fenway Park and the theme was really around aeronautical engineering and the kids were able to learn from NASA scientists about their careers and the current work that's going on at NASA and it was really exciting because when we got the Commissioner of Education's um, newsletter for the week there were three Hopkinton High School kids in it so that was great surprise the solar panels are now installed on the roof at Marathon. I was there today and took that picture and they are looking great. And so now just to cut to a little bit of budget. We, the school committee and the select board had a joint meeting last week on the 24th of September. The purpose of that was to really take a look at what our FY21 budget increase would be. The first number that we received was 5.54%, and you know we expressed to the Board of Selectmen some concerns around that number. Uh, so what you see on the right-hand side, it came for, in a memo from Norman Kamala, who is our town manager, and as we go through our budget, pro budget process, what he has asked us to do is to sort of justify our budgets from the bottom up and really take a look at what we have in our operating budget and think, is there anything that we can streamline and be more efficient about? Um, and when we meet with the town manager and do our budget review, um, we will be able to sort of articulate, you know, what it, what, what it is that we've been doing in terms of efficiency. Uh, what they would like us to do is when we submit our budget is to achieve an overall tax impact um, of net, new net growth of 2.5%, and that will obviously um, accept any kinds of exclusions. Uh, our budgets are to be developed to sustain the current level of services. So, you know, thinking ahead and developing great big programs and any of the programs you've seen in this presentation tonight. So some of the things where we're talking about STEAM or those, those have really been given to us through um, grant funding. Like the STEAM grant that we got was for $130,000 to help us with that process in this district. So that was an amazing grant. And, you know, whether or not it will be sustainable or renewable in, in, current, in coming years, we don't know. Um, and then the last thing um, is that specific instructions on FY21 will, for our capital requests will be coming from the chief financial officer. So I have, in fact, been working with um, both Tim and Susan to take a look at our capital expenditures for, uh, for FY21. I will say that 5.54% um, is not going to be enough money to run our schools next year. Um, I've been, as I've moved throughout the community and my previous presentation would indicate over and over again that if we only looked at our obligations that we have negotiated with teachers in regard to their salary and that's cost of living, lane changes and step raises, we are 
you know, at about a million and a half right there. And if we looked at the teachers that we know are going to need at Hopkins just because of enrollment, we have another half million. So we're at, you know, two million dollars, which is four percent, and that doesn't take into account any of the increases that we would need for Marathon, Elmwood, the middle school, uh, the high school, or special education funding. So we really had, I'm perfectly happy to go through that process of building a budget from the ground up and really thinking about how we can streamline what we already do. Um, but just in terms of personnel with 254 new students, uh, there's, there's no possible way that we are going to be able to put teachers in front of our kids next year at 5.54%. And the last blurb that I have on there just sort of re-articulates that, that our most costly asks in the school department this year will be full-time um, educators, and we mean both teachers and paraprofessionals for FY21. These are today's current enrollment numbers. We are at 254, and I know last time we looked at these numbers, we were at 251. The good news is there's only three additional students in the last couple of weeks, so you can see that our enrollment is starting to level off now, which is, which is comforting, really. Um, what's not comforting is to take a look at the class sizes at Hopkins, and even though it says 24, over those 12 classrooms, it's really 24 in a percentage. So you know that some of the classrooms in grades four and five have hit 25, maybe even 26, um, due to some interesting circumstances. But grade three and uh, grade one are also pretty high. And if we looked at where our targets would be, our targets for K and one would be 18 to 19, two and three, 19 to 20, and no more than 22 in grades four and five. And so you are seeing that we're really exceeding our class sizes across the board at the elementary level. So let's take a look here at just some of the impacts of increased enrollment, and there are many of them, but I thought I would just give you sort of a little snippet of what that looks like. Uh, this week I received an email from a junior parent who reported that her child is um, in classes where there are 30 students in her honors math class, 28 students in her AP US history class, and 27 students in her AP chemistry class. Um, so going into next year and looking at those numbers, and I want to be very fair about this. So if we know that there are 30 students in that honors math class, there is another section of that class where there are 19 kids. So when you, when you build your, your schedule and you look and you say, how many students have enrolled for this class? We have 30 and we have 19, so there's 49. So as Mr. Bishop and Mr. Hannett and Mr. Pominville are creating that, they can say, oh, we need two sections. We could have 25 in this one and 24 in that one. But as you build a high school schedule, you start to realize that in order to give children everything that they want, right, we could certainly take a kid out of that, that classroom of 30 and move them to the 19, but if we do, then something else that that child really wanted in their schedule is gonna to have to be taken away. So that's why we have that inequity. So 25 and 24 isn't, aren't terrible numbers when you're looking at high school kids in honors math because high school kids in honors math they work really hard and, and they keep going and there's an opportunity for the teacher to work with students but when you hit 30 the level of instruction declines clearly so my point in all of that is I, I really want to be fair about discussing class sizes at the high school level I don't want to be you know, sort of alarmist and take a look at just those numbers but those numbers can be a little alarming but going into this budget, we do know that Mr. Bishop is going to have to ask for portions of FTEs to be doled out. You know, and we don't know what that looks like yet. We'll be starting the budget process. He'll be looking at kids and numbers and this year, which will help us to drive next year. It's not necessarily a perfect science because we have a student-generated schedule. So what kids are enrolled in this year doesn't mean that they'll be enrolled in the same courses or have the same desires next year. But we will be making best guesses of where we need students. I mean, where we need educators. We have lots of students, <laughs> to be Dr. clear. Dr. Kevin, on that point, I mean, I, I have a high school student, so I agree 100%. The class sizes are, it's a number, but it's not always indicative. I mean, sometimes a 30-person classroom is completely fine. You yes. Know, from a student perspective, I'm curious if you've heard much from the teachers um, in terms of, I mean, it's just the reality of if you're like a Lang teacher or an AP history teacher and you're, you know, there must be restrictions on what they can physically grade. Like, I can only assign an X number of word paper, even if I think they should be writing longer, but you know, because they just can't grade it. Or have you heard much feedback from the teachers in terms of their perception? I think a lot of the students learn quite well, in my personal experience, even if it's 28 or 30 kids. That these are, especially these classes, are pretty, 
honors and AP classes, the kids are pretty self-motivated. Mm -hmm. But the burden on the teachers, from what I've observed as a parent, seems to be getting very high, especially where there's a lot of grading involved. Sure. So I think that the teachers are probably experiencing the same kinds of things that the students are experiencing. So if you're that math teacher, for example, you have a session, a section where you have 30 kids and you have a section where you have 19 kids. So, I mean, sort of essentially, if you were going to teach 50 kids in those two classes, like, it's still that's kind of still 50 kids. Yeah. It, it does, I think, tax what you're doing in the classroom of 30 because you'd want to get to those three over there and maybe there just isn't time to do that, but in a classroom of 19, you may move through your curriculum a whole lot more swiftly because you have time for a lot more one-on-one -on -one and kids are getting the material more quickly because you have that, that uh, luxury, so to speak. Um, I know that Mr. Bishop did meet with his union reps recently and they did express that you know some of the class sizes are really high at the high school and they're very reasonable they go through the numbers with him and they realize that not all of them are like that but as and to be fair also last year Mr. Bishop did add faculty mid-year so some of the teachers that he added in FY 19 are really in the FY20 budget. Right. So we're paying this year for the people that we sort of had last year, if that sort of makes sense, yes. right? Um, so he's, he's got a few extra people there. He will need some portions of FTEs. And I know what you're saying about the teachers. It's more of that same, I have a really inflated kind of classroom here, but this is a lot more manageable, you know? And then there's some courses that are crazy. Like every kid wants to take AP whatever. But, you know, if we take a look at, the CP this or the honors that, those classes are, are nicely managed. Yeah. And to be fair also, he <coughs> and Mr. Pominville and Mr. Hanna have made a concerted effort to keep college prep classes somewhere around 20 or below. And I think that that's where we get to a place where we can see that our, the, the growth and the achievement scores of some of our lowest 25% are, are we're keeping pace because of that, because we, we look at, at what children really, really need. You know, as you said, if you have 27 kids in an AP chemistry class, it's certainly not ideal, but kids in AP chemistry are very highly motivated kids, and they will get it done. You know, they'll find ways. And our teachers, to their credit, I should point this out as well, our science department in this high school, in order to be able to um, get in touch with kids, not just in sort of those after school remedial sessions, are doing kind of online sessions. They've got, you know, information that they have put out, almost like, you know, Khan Academy kinds of things for their courses. But they are really getting it done and making sure that kids have what they need to learn. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a little bit tricky, but they are holding it together. And, and I, I probably should, maybe even at the beginning of this, have, have recognized our teachers in the district for doing all that they are doing right now with so few resources you know, that much enrollment. So. Um, our preschool numbers, I sat down with Lauren De DeBoe and Dr. Karen Zaleski, and as we looked at the preschool numbers, we currently have six sections of preschool, and you can put seven students on IEPs into those classrooms with their typical peers so that you can reach a classroom total of 15. At this point, we have 32 or 33 students enrolled in preschool, and it's October. So what will happen between October and June is students will start to turn three. And as a child turns three, we enroll them, and then they turn three and we enroll them. And what usually happens throughout the year is we get about 10 more kids. If we are at 32, we can never exceed 42 in that number without hiring another teacher. Uh, given what we know about the population of kids who are at, you know, two years and eight months, two years and nine months, two years and ten months, it will be very soon before they start arriving in our classrooms. If we don't need to hire a preschool teacher this year, we will most assuredly need to hire an additional preschool teacher next year. Maybe this year. Um, and while I also say 42 is the magic number, it isn't always the magic number because sometimes, um, 40 becomes your cap because these kids are identified as moderate needs, intensive needs, and you can only, you know, sort of fill certain classrooms to capacity, right? So um, that will be, you know, another ask probably during this year, and when we ask for it this year, we'll be paying it forward, you know, sort of next year. Um, when we get that classroom, it will mean that we now have health on a cart at the Marathon Elementary School. 
That was my question. Do we yes. have a classroom for that teacher? We, we do don't. not have a classroom okay. for that teacher. And technically, the preschool is in a wing. The health classroom is right outside of that wing. So, you know, they will even be a little bit outside of the preschool wing. Is this one of those cases where you said that it's 7 to 15? So seven students on IEPs, on IEPs in a classroom with a max of 15 head count. Correct. So if we get the 15th student on an IEP, are we, do we then have to have another classroom? When you get to the seventh student on an IEP, you have to start filling the next classroom with students on IEPs right. because the other eight kids will make up the typical peers. So, every, so that budget wise or classroom wise, or we don't have a choice. Like we have to have Correct. those classrooms. So that's yes. not even negotiable. Exactly, okay. yes. And I think what I'm trying to do with some of my budget presentations right now is to show <laughs> places where there are non-negotiables. Yes. You know, like the five teachers at, at Hopkins, they are probably non-negotiable. Given the number of kids we have in grade three and grade four, and when we pay them forward next year or move them forward next year, we right now Vanessa Bellello, principal at Hopkins, has 12th, fourth grades and 12th, fifth grades. Next year, she's going to need 14 fourth grades, 14 fifth grades. Yeah. And the picture at the right, while it should be a happy picture of a child working with a teacher, is a little bit of a sad picture only because that picture is taken in a hallway at Marathon. So we have now sort of run out of small spaces for kids to work one-on-one -on -one with teachers, and we've started to move kids out into hallways at Marathon. Um, the room that was originally the PLC room is now uh, a room in which we have English language learners being taught. You know, so th these are, are really very nice, airy, light-filled spaces. But um, my point in showing this is that the you know marathon is starting to you know we're starting to outgrow that school, and we opened its doors a year ago. All right, and this I just I got this email today. Uh, let's see, at 10.27 a.m. And I couldn't help myself but put it into this presentation. Uh, Kayla Sables is the secretary here at the high school. Hi, all. The student desks were finally delivered today. Below is the current list of classrooms that need additional desks. And I like to put this in because it's showing us that, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, why don't you just hire more teachers at the high school? Essentially, there is no more room at the high school, and we don't even have the desks for kids at the high school. So when we're ordering desks to put in front of children, we have a growth problem, right? And there you go. There it is. And we're doling them out one desk at a time. No one's getting a lot of them, let me tell you. You needed one, you asked for one, you're getting one. And that's all you're getting. So. All right, and then uh, I hope that people will turn out next week, not next week, two weeks from now at our next meeting. Uh, we will be having our capital budget presentation. The big drivers for capital budget will be the Elmwood Feasibility Study, modular classrooms at our elementary schools, uh, hopefully additional high school classrooms, and um, the roofs at the middle school in Hopkins. So those are all big capital drivers right now. All right, and this is just uh, the last piece of it, just the, oops, missing an eye there, uh, the superintendent goals update. Um, goal number one, working very hard, as you can tell, on enrollment. We've been assessing the capacity of each of the school buildings relative to the growth. I've been working with Mrs. Rothermick and Mr. Person, um, taking a look at um, the capital budget and what we're going to need. Uh, we have to remember we've had an additional 500 students, more than 500, over three years. So all of our all of our buildings are really bursting at the seams. The capacity study is coming along nicely. I recently met with Dr. Arthur Wagman. He's been talking to some of the realtors in town and other people who are kind of in the know. And uh, one of the realtors um, is also a person who is on the town growth uh, study group. So there's a lot of sort of um, collaboration and communication around the community on that and the the big asks as I said again it's going to be budgeting for the additional FTEs um, my third goal was communication I've been communicating with individuals families and groups uh, continuing to write my blog posts informing the community of school committee meetings and at first I didn't know how that would go but we are actually getting email back from people when they get information about the school committee meeting people will say oh, I'm going to come to that because I want to see whatever so and we have some examples of that here tonight 
that's great. Um, filming highlights from the Hill. I have an episode tomorrow morning, and then uh, the one after that, I'll be interviewing uh, Rich Cormier, who is our new AD. And then after that, Carla Crisofuli and Valerie Lachansky, who are working not only on STEAM, but Carla's end of it is to do um, some of the career vocational technical education. Updating the community on enrollment and budget needs. That information goes out, and I will continue to keep doing that. And keep attending meetings, such as the growth study meetings, the CPAC meetings, you know, as I'm able to do that. And my goal number four was innovation. You can see our STEAM program is up and running. Uh, Mrs. Lachansky is working like crazy on that. And we've started to really get in touch with a lot of the classroom teachers and taking a look at some of their needs and hopes and dreams and wishes. Um, I have been working alongside Jen, who's really the driving force between, behind all of the career vocational technical education. It really came from a lot of the grant work that she had done. And you and Carla have been amazing on that. So thank you for that. Um, initiating the special education service delivery stuff at Marathon. Uh, just last week, we met with the consultant and Lauren DeBow and Karen Zaleski. So they'll be going in and just taking a look at how we deliver student services. And the last part is encouraging the kind of programmatic growth that you saw in these previous slides. I think that we can have a very nicely streamlined budget and make a lot of this work through some of the grants that we've been writing. Uh, without the $130,000 grant I was looking at, uh, you know, some of the grants that have already been approved, and I think it's about a million and a half that we've brought in in grant money this mm -hmm. year. So. Nice work. And when I say we, I kind of mean <laughs> my friend over here and Dr. Zaleski as well. So they've worked so hard on getting us grant money. Okay. They should be commended for that. Yeah. And that's, that's all I've got. Any questions? Okay. So moving along, the next item, um, the SE Chair Report. I have approved the payroll warrant, S20007 and S2007V. Payroll warrants have been included in your packet. I've also approved warrants number 20-014, 20-015, and 20-016. Warrants have been included in your packet. Besides this, I have a few other updates. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh spoke about the joint meeting that we had with the Select Board and Appropriations Committee, I'm very thankful that um, each of the school committee members was able to join. Um, I felt that the Select Board and the Appropriation Committee members uh, were willing to recognize the needs related to growth uh, while asking for overall fiscal responsibility. We shared some of the challenges that teachers are facing, as I think, Amanda, you pointed to earlier, that while the students may not immediately feel that, the teachers are working very hard. But doing this over a long period in time, it is bound to have an effect on student experience. So all these aspects we were able to bring forth, and I felt that um, our town partners were willing to understand that aspect. As I stated at the joint meeting, we are in this together. From the school standpoint, we are committed to building a budget ground up. We will seek board and community participation throughout the process. Dr. Kavanaugh is inviting. Um, I'm looking to all of the members here uh, that we'll come up with recognizing different groups to come join us throughout this three-month process so that it's not a surprise that they are walking this process with us um, so the community understands these needs throughout. Um, so hopefully next time when we meet, we'll bring the calendar and look to see who all we can reach to join us uh, during the conversations that we have. And I have no doubt Dr. Kavanaugh and her leadership team will bring forth all needs uh, in a fiscally responsible manner, as they always do. Um, in this regard, I'd also like to call out last year Ms. Colleen Giannino, who had made a request only of a few hundred dollars, if you recall that. So, you know, I have no doubt you'll bring forth what is absolutely needed. And we see those examples all along. Um, there were also uh, there was communication received from members of the community who wrote with concerns about a uh, policy that we are going to review tonight related to student privacy and some concerns with uh, possible violations of FERPA, IDEA, and also concerns of bullying. A parent wrote that Hopkinton is at the forefront of keeping students' interest with this policy. Um, uh, she suggested an opt-in option rather than an opt-out option. 
A community member also wanted details on the status of the name change of Columbus Day. Uh, he supported a holiday to celebrate the culture of the native people, at the same time wanted Italian-American kids to keep their heroes too. Uh, he has forbidden an invite to the Upton Stone Chamber with a talk on the uh, uh, Indian tribe associated with the same. Um, he was put in touch with the calendar subcommittee, uh, with this Dr. Cavanaugh and Professor Tyler. Um, next week, I'll be meeting Representative Dykema, and uh, her office was able to make an arrangement with uh, Senator Spilka's office, uh, and a representative from uh, Senator Spilka's office would be joining as well. My goal is to impress upon them the growth-related needs and request any and all options for assistance at the state level. I've also been exploring how best to engage with the community on social media. Um, it has been challenging for me to see some of the dialogue that goes on on social media. I feel the need to say something. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to get engaged on that without having everyone's input and some strategy around the same. And I think there are some uh, restrictions around that. And I know, Amanda, you spoke about some restrictions on you know, how we can engage and how do we manage all of that information. Right. Right, I think there, you know, it's, it's a big topic for when it, when it gets onto our agenda, if and when, but certainly there are open meeting law considerations. There are also a lot of um, technical considerations around archiving um, our information and um, lots of, for a public body, there are lots of considerations for what we do as a public body on social media. But if we want to explore it, you know, we can bring that forth. Thank you. And, and I know uh, Nancy does a fabulous job of responding, and I would love her input too on how we can our go better. Our attorney had addressed some of that last summer. It might mm -hmm. be worth trying to circle back okay. to, I don't remember specifically what she had said, but if we're going to put something in place, it would be worthwhile to just have the back. attorney weigh in on that. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's where the world is moving or has moved, uh, so I think it's important to look at that. Uh, the only other update I have is that we haven't yet formed the budget advisory committee, which you know we haven't convened yet. I hope that we do that sooner rather than later. I think it's important to uh, go through that and have those discussions onward. Um, on to office hours. Uh, we had our office hours, um, was it last week? Monday, Monday the 23rd if I remember correctly. Uh, it was not so popular this time, uh, <laughs> but we did have um, a couple of voices in there. Uh, Amanda, would you like to share with the? Sure. Yep. I joined Mina for the first hour of office hours, and um, Cheryl Ann was there from Project Just Because. She came by, and um, we had a really interesting discussion about uh, what is visible from Project Just Because is perspective in terms of the need in the community. It's not always visible to us. I think when it comes to things like financial aid, filling out forms, and actually officially asking for support, families are very reluctant to do that. It doesn't mean the need isn't there. So um, she talked a lot about the need um, that she sees, particularly around food. Um, they started offering breakfast. They have muffins um, in the morning, and people do come by and pick up breakfast for their family for a few days, no questions asked. Everything at the food pantry is no questions asked. And she was um, pretty adamant about that. You can just come, you don't have to demonstrate need, you can, there's food there. Um, so it, as it relates to school committee, I think a couple of things came up. Families are having a hard time finding the resources because um, we often have sort of insider lingo on like our website. You know, if you've lived here for 30 years, you know what Project Just Because is. If you just moved in, you might not realize, oh, that's the food pantry, too. So one request that she had was to consider um, adding the words food pantry to the website and tagging it for search, which I've passed on to Mr. Ghosh um, to add to some changes there. So uh, simple changes like that can certainly help get families connected with the resources because they have the food, they have the supplies, the clothing, the school supplies, they just want to make sure that people know to find them. So, um, and you know, the other question is how can we, what role can we play, can the schools play, and uh, certainly the bridge mm -hmm. committee is probably a big 
piece of that um, exchange, but what can we do to help connect um, the resources with the needs? And whether it's, I through you know, just more awareness for our teachers to know what's out there, so that when they're when they're observing behavior in the classroom that might be hunger related or so, that they can kind of discreetly can pass that information on. Or um, are there? What can we do? Is there anything that we can do as a school department to help just make sure that our families are provided for? And I know that that is a lot of you know what the bridge committee is probably looking at, um, and that was just the need that she voiced. So. So we are, if I can just piggyback Please. on that, we are seeing um, in the schools, and I, I did actually meet with her in the spring, to be able to, for teachers to be able to identify just visually kids who are coming to school with no snack, mm -hmm. to be able to provide snacks for kids, no questions asked for kids that are not have, able to get them from home. And we are actually getting from the bridge uh, requests from the schools for kids that they're seeing that, that are not able to get supplies so that that helps bridge between Project Us Because and other organizations to get kids the help that they need in a way because there are, I think, to what you said, there are a lot of people who for whatever reason either don't know where the resources are or they have different barriers of reluctance to ask for help and to try to help get them there. So that's. You know, they're an important partner, Project Us Because is, in our community. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Nancy. Did you want to share? So, and I just had a parent who had uh, expressed some concern over their bus stop and the looking they, to make an appeal on the change to the bus stop. That's uh, obviously not within the purview of the school committee, so I did bounce that back. Yes, um, and for you. parents who did make appeals tomorrow morning is the day that we hear the appeals. Yeah. So there's a meeting first thing tomorrow morning. That's great. I, I understand um, that there are a number of appeals that, may, that you have had through transportation. We have, and I think that the issue um, has been that, you know, and again, it's related to growth and mm -hmm. enrollment. So if you used to have a two-mile bus route and we had 20 kids who got on in that bus route now we have 30 kids who get on that bus route, which means we can't stop the bus 30 times we can still only stop it 20 times because it has to get back to that school in a timely fashion because the buses are all tiered so that means that kids are we have what we sort of call you know those consolidated stops right so kids are gonna have to walk to a stop and walk to a stop and you know and it is difficult for families I absolutely you know empathize with them but but there is a process for looking at safety. There is, it's yes. So we look very carefully to make sure that, you know, there's lighting or sidewalks or, you know, those kinds of things, especially as the snow falls. Hopefully it will be uh, in your report next time. Maybe you'll have some updates for us. Try to remember I that. thought you were going to say hopefully it will be a long time before the snow falls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that that is okay. Um, also, we have uh, an upcoming office hours, October 13th at the farmer's market. And one of the ideas that was brought forth um, through Amanda and I believe Dr. Kavanaugh too, is to have a theme around office hours and hopefully that will bring some people into the discussions. So obviously we have been talking about growth quite a bit. Um, so it seems very uh, reasonable to speak to have that theme. Um, talk about growth and perhaps student experience as part of you know growth what what are what do kids have to say what are parents thinking you know this parent talking about you know 30 kids in the classroom I've heard someone talk about the computer science classroom being absolutely full so you know just hearing some of that I think you know just putting a theme out there would help right? and um, I think we have some idea of who all is able to attend at the farmer's market, but I'll double check. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, new business, policy JBD, gender identity support, Dr. Kavanaugh. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped. I skipped, thank you, Nancy. Um, item F, uh, liaison reports. Anyone have updates? I have three, if you would like to uh, hear three quickies here. Yes, um, please. The first is the planning board meeting from September 23rd, um, largely not directly affecting the school committee, but one of the big conversations at the planning board was about easements, and I think um, as that project gets underway, 
Um, I think ultimately it'll affect the school department, maybe not the school committee, because I think that um, traffic concerns are becoming a little bit more significant in town. We've had the sort of test run of the utility work that's been going on in the single lane through the center of town for the last month. So um, especially the Marathon Elmwood bus, I think that this could um, have an impact on transportation, at least as once the construction actually does start to happen, if the construction does start to happen. So anyway, I think we do need to keep an eye on that because um, you know, easements and property rights are was were the topic of conversation, but that got me thinking that if this does get resolved, we're going to have a problem, I think, yes, in I, terms of, of transportation. I think, so we already do have a problem, because even though they say that they're going to stop construction at 2, and they're very good about that, by the time it's 2 o'clock, the traffic is so backed up that it's still difficult for the buses to, right. to move. Um, at our next meeting, I think we're going to be looking to have the crossing guard who is usually at the corner of um, Pleasant and 135 uh, get there a little bit earlier. So that we'll be adding hours, but at least then with the, hi the high school and middle school buses, we'll be able to stop traffic and get those buses through because right now they're not getting to Hopkins on time and then they don't get to Elmwood and Marathon on time. And kids are on buses for hours because of it. Yep. So that was planning board. Um, and then connected to that, I went to the um, Girl Study committee, committee meeting on the 1st. Um, that actually was a great meeting. Um, the Board of Assessors and our um, CFO, Tim O'Leary, presented some great information, um, specifically about how the, a lot of our budget, everyone's budget, has been funded um, in no small part thanks to the new growth that's been happening in the town over the last several years. Um, so it's, you know, the problem is, yes, we're bursting at the seams at, in our schools, um, but that money has been helping fuel the budgets in all of the town departments. Um, so one thing that Tim did say that I think is, um, with me anyway, definitely resound really, um, I'll let it speak for itself. He basically said, you know, um, as we look ahead and we realize that the schools are such a huge chunk of our budget and, and that, um, you know, it is, we are a, big, a very large portion of the town's budget. Um, his comment was something to the effect of, we have to decide based on the um, increase in property values in the town and based on the sort of draw that Hopkinton has had over the last several years, largely in part to the amazing school system that exists in town. Um, his comment was, do we want to feed the golden goose or beat it with a stick? <laughs> and so I thought that was a great comment because I think, um, you know, it, it is, we are expensive to the town and, um, you know, but we also are important to the town in terms of maintaining the, the sort of influx of, of, of folks coming in who want to move in for our school. So um, he had a great presentation and I have copies of it if anybody's interested, but it's definitely, um, it, it was an interesting way that he sort of framed his whole conversation to say like yes you know we get it this is a big chunk of the of our of our money but this is um this is why we've had such great um you know uh the real estate market and everything else has sort of taken off i would um, love jim, to see that mm -hmm. it was great jim quickly was he talking about the schools being the we golden are the goose, golden goose or is it the new growth no, no we are the golden goose Mina. yes we are yes the schools um Hopefully and so not getting beaten with stick. well you know i i think that the the hard part i think is that you know every when we walk into a meeting and say we need nine percent over last year's budget it's a tricky number to hear for a lot of people, and absolutely, I 100% respect that. But also, if they want things to continue to operate the way that they have been, that's kind of the number that we need in order to keep things operating at the at the level that they have been. So, I think it was a good presentation he made, um, and you know, he basically said if if we continue to use new growth as a way to fund our, our town departments, which we all hopefully are all aware of, and then we get into a very tricky situation once Legacy Farms is completed because we're going to have to either decide if we want to operate in a lower service environment or a higher tax environment mm -hmm. because that new growth will no longer be able, won't be there, basically. So it was good. It was a good presentation. I'm very glad you went to that meeting. We had calendar subcommittee that night, so we couldn't go. But I love to go to those meetings. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a good one. 
Are they looking at the um, the build out of the town, like uh, the un the buildable but not yet built on land, to sort of get a sense of, you know, yep. it will be ten years from now. Like, what when are we going to be more like at Maximville? And I I asked it. I, I know they don't know. And I was actually just looking at the Framingham numbers. And for a town that I thought was totally built out, I think their kindergarten is like double their graduating class, or something. So there's a you know, just because it looks built doesn't mean it's not going to grow. Right. Right. But still, we have so much land. I know a lot of it is. Um, Preserved, they right? they did he he did break it down by um, um, yes including sort of vacant land unused land unused land or um, land that hasn't been developed um, but also the, another comment that he made that was really I think sat very well with me is you know not that long ago the city of Boston people were thinking where are we going to put all these people where are we going to put all these people we've run out of space for these people. And you find a way, you know. You go right. up. Not to say that Hopkinton should become a Boston, obviously, but I mean, I think that that's the thing. We we will find space, but we're going to have growing pains. Yeah. Yeah. And then, last but not least, if you want to actually, you could take this one if you wanted to. Both Amanda and I attended the Upper Charles Trail yeah, meeting last night, um, which was dedicated solely towards the Campus Connector Trail, which is the trail that Jane came to our um, two of our meetings to present. Um, do you want to go? I've been talking. No, 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 you can go. go for it. No, you're good. So, <laughs> I'll chime in. All right. Um, the engineer from um, VHB presented his take on um, sort of how things would go. It's very, still very much a preliminary um, project. Folks at the meeting, there were only um, 13 members of the community at the meeting and then two um, select board members. Um, Actually, I might be lying too. I think there were 13 total, including the select board members. But um, their primary concern at the time wasn't so much that it was going through the campus, but what the surface was going to be um, on the trail that went through the campus, um, which is still too far off into the future for anybody to be. But I, I did actually email Dr. Kavanaugh and ask, you know, does anyone in the school have a, a preference? Is there um, Tim or Susan or anyone in buildings and grounds? And um, so we got some feedback that maybe stone dust would be better just because if kids are running on it, but it wasn't a strong preference. It didn't feel like a strong right. preference in any way. So, um, but that's too far in advance. Otherwise, it was just a question of, um, a couple folks asked, um, why? Why are we going through the schools? You know, why, why is this, um, do, do we need a, to connect Marathon to um, Center Trail were the questions. And so I think Jane did a great job of fielding the questions and basically saying this is a big picture um, project and this is just a little piece of the project and there's grant money available and so she wants to jump on the grant money if at all possible in order to make the project happen. Mm -hmm. So this is the piece that they're focusing on. Um, and the chief um, of police was there. He said, you know, this is a, to him this seems like a great proposal um, the um, his title not assistant chief vice chief vice, vice chief of the fire assistant department chief. Okay. I forgive deputy? me for not no. deputy chief thank deputy you it could chief. be that yes he was there and he he concurred with chiefly sorry for butchering your title um, <laughs> so anyway I, I think it's going to be a great project they they need to um, it's still very much in its infancy though so right. it's good to hear about but not necessarily set in stone yeah, I think this is, they're still checking the boxes needed to apply for the grant money right. to do the study, you know, to get, it's, um, so there, it is very preliminary, and I think the earliest possible and probably not feasible grow, uh, build would be like 2022, yeah. but even that seems, two years. Um, you know, there are a lot of steps and a lot of grants along the way, Right. but yeah, so, it's good. Okay. Any other updates? Uh, no, just there is a website subcommittee meeting um, for anyone interested. Uh, it is going to be at 7 a.m. on, um, I think, the 3rd. No, sorry, the 10th, next week. 7 a.m. Um, on October 10th um, here at the high school in the A219 to um, review the website status and talk about a community survey uh, to see how well we've met our goals with the, the um, the district website. So I have um, a couple quick ones. One is the turf field oversight uh, committee met. Uh, there are some repairs that are being done to the infield outfield scene that are covered under the warranty. 
Uh, the pitching mound was swapped out um, for something that would be better for the type of shoes. We don't want people wearing the metal spikes in, on the turf fields, so we're trying to make that as easy as possible. Uh, and uh, some talk around the signs, and also, uh, importantly, trying to find the balance between meeting the needs of the high school students on the turf field and the practices the high school has and the uh, trying to get some rental income in there and we were looking at projections for kind of moving things along with that so things are things are going along well with that uh, so then the other piece uh, is the bridge is going to be meeting i think it might be in two weeks i don't have the date off the top it's before we meet here again uh, and again like i had referenced before we have had some requests from schools directly to us for um, to connect them with supplies for kids who are showing up that are not able to get supplies. So that's good that the word is getting out there um, to help kids. So. Great, thank you. I have uh, two small updates. One, uh, Amanda, myself, and Dr. Kavner, we went to the community communications group, which is always fun to meet with people. Uh, and there's so many ideas that emerged from the, uh, that discussion. One of the things that um, uh, HCAM, um, I think he is the station director, we like to call him the emperor, uh, Jim Cousins, um, who uh, uh, who suggested or is working on a volunteer match website. And um, so we were wondering, you know, how is it that it would benefit and is there any way we could plug in from the, is there any connection that we could do on the school front? But th those are to be seen and there's so many things that come along with it. Um, and in conversations with uh, Amanda, we also felt that perhaps two of us are not needed as liaison to uh, that group and, you know, just having Dr. Kavanaugh present there and listening to everybody and being accessible to the community groups. That's a great way to look at it. So it'll, for this upcoming year, it will be me, and we'll talk about that when we look at the liaison rules as well. Besides that, we also started the conversation a little bit, Amanda and I, on the procedures front. I've yet to share some of the documentation where we left off, Nancy, you and I. But we started the preliminary conversation on the purpose behind doing it, and what, is, what are some of the other districts who have done this, um, et cetera. So those are the two things that we worked on. Um, Amanda, do you have anything else to add to that? No? No. OK, great. Sounds good. OK, now on to new business. We are running 15 mi minutes behind. So hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll make up. Um, policy JBD, Gender Identity Support. Dr. Kavno. Sure. So I think that this came about because I had gone to a tech meeting, which is an education collaborative meeting. And someone there had said that the town of Framingham had adopted a policy for uh, gender identity support. And the policy subcommittee was meeting, so um, Jen and I had met. And we took a look at what Framingham had. And they had an enormous document that uh, was part of their athletic program. But then we went to the MASC website, and we saw that they had just a, a policy that we thought might make for a good beginning. Uh, so this would be a policy that is brand spanking new to the Hopkinton Public Schools, but we have you know, many students who are um, gender nonconforming, transgender, and, and we feel like if there's something sort of written and in place to um, ensure that students are feeling safe and respected, respected and supported in our schools, then this would probably be a good policy for us to have. I don't know if you want to add something to that. No, I mean, really, that was it. We feel like... It, it, in practice right now, it is what's expected, but it, if we can add a policy to just sort of frame that those expectations a little more officially, I think that's the way to go. Dr. Kavner, was there any feedback received from anybody? From this? No, I think we just one? have some folks who wanted to support it. Okay. That's great. So is this is a policy that we have to run so by thank you for coming. Council? I think that's the other one. That's the other one, but well, we no, did. I, I know that that one. Oh. I'm just, I'm wondering, I was just wondering if this is a policy that needs to go by the legal counsel. We did check into or? the legality of some of the language because um, as we were putting it together, we weren't sure about um, name changes, whether or not they had to be legal name changes um, yeah. on um, transcripts mm -hmm. and report cards and things like that, but actually it does not. No, students can you know, change their names 
you know, as far as they go in sort of all the student records, power school and everything, and even on their transcripts. Yep. So if you would feel better that we run it by legal counsel, I'm happy to do that. No, I mean, I think typically when we rely on the MASC base, yes. that's the beauty of that is that MASC has done due diligence. I just, I had had a lot of questions about the naming. It, I was very surprised at the Mass General Law and then the name changes and um, Dr. Right. Kavanaugh had directed me to the MGL and I learned a whole lot about <laughs> name changes. As did we that day. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I don't think that there are any legal issues. I just wasn't sure if where it's a new policy and it's um, uh, sort of a, it's a new area of policy for many districts if it was something we were concerned about. I mean, it, lo it looked good to me once I learned the law. Yes. So. so I love that we're doing this. I just want to put that out there. I, my one question is um, if we want to have the uh, Gay Straight Alliance take a look at it and or anybody to make sure we go, we're, in, we're in, including everything we want to make sure is included in it. Yeah, I would be happy to send that to, to Luke. Oh, <laughs> we brought some people with us. Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> Would you like to come join? Sure. Come to the Please. microphone. That would be great. And I did not know that they were here, so I, I was not. <laughs> I didn't know you were good. Yeah, it's great. I if you would like to just introduce yourself. Okay, hi. I'm Madison Luce. I'm a sophomore here at the high school, and I'm one of the co-presidents of GSA. And I'm Bryce Fodi. I'm a junior here at the high school. I'm not a president, but I'm a major member of the GSA. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I feel really lucky to live in a town, especially that really um, cares a lot about its students enough to write policy and to create um, rules that protect LGBT students. As a really prominent member of the LGBT community in this school, most people know of my sexual identity. Most people know I've like taught sex ed classes with Miss Millette and Mr. Sanborn on like sexual orientation and about gender identity. So I feel really lucky that I can feel safe to walk around these hallways, but I do know that a lot of trans students around the country, I'm not trans, but I do know a lot of trans students and a lot of LGBT students around the country don't have that same luxury that I do. Um, and I think it's really great that we're implementing new policies, and I think this is a really great start. I am transgender myself. I'm a transgender man. And I have gone through the process of getting my name changed through the school before this policy, and I had it changed almost a year before I got my name legally changed. So I'm aware that these are the processes that were, and it, it did work amazingly well for me. I have good, felt good. well supported in this system. And this policy reflects almost exactly the, the positive aspects of my transition within the school system. So I really do appreciate you putting it into writing. Great. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. So good idea, Nancy. So so good thing <laughs> you know, we know, yeah. <laughs> it's really great to have a lot of visibility. Um, I think it's really important as we're like getting into a new age and there is still transphobia everywhere. There is still homophobia everywhere. It happens in these hallways. A lot of people don't see it. And there are people like us who are strong enough to be like, forget it and move on. And just, you know, I just want to make sure it's a safe place for students who don't have that same attitude towards it and how it's hard, especially like uh, it's really hard to discover yourself in high school. A lot of people don't know who they are. And so it's really nice to have a supportive administration like backing LGBT students. Are there things that, it, 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 this is not to put you on the spot, but because you can certainly reach back out to us if you think right. of things that are additional things that we have not thought of that are not included to make sure that students feel safe and supported by, you know, everybody. The, the one thing I would add is sort of things about bathrooms or changing rooms because I spent yeah. my freshman year changing for gym in a storage closet and I found that yeah. very uh, separating. It, it's an uncomfortable experience having to be let into a specific room. To be, so even though obviously we can't, it would be incredibly difficult, it, difficult to add an additional locker room or do something like that, but just make it a more, um, instead of having gym teachers be put on the spot trying to find a place for you to change when you're in the process of transitioning and not yet comfortable changing in your preferred locker room, or if you maybe you're never comfortable changing there, it's a personal decision. But it would be helpful to have an established place where people who aren't comfortable in the traditional male and female changing rooms could go or have more. Hello, I'm afraid of the boys' locker room. I'm afraid of the boys' locker room. <laughs> <laughs> We're so used to that noise. <laughs> That's never <laughs> happened during a meeting, as far as I know. So yeah. <laughs> Speaking of locker rooms, have a, a more distinct way of showing that one of the 
the staff restrooms is technically open to students who are gender nonconforming or uncomfortable in one of the traditional open bathrooms. So just have more clear marking of that as an availability. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, the other back. thing is, uh, while my experience is very different, um, in middle school, I had just recently come out and I was outed to the seventh grade class by a friend who I trusted. And I wasn't really ready to face that yet. And I faced a lot of discrimination in the locker room because people were, you know, saying things that were not true about me that I would like look at other girls in the locker room. And that was really damaging to my self esteem. And I started like changing in the bathroom because I didn't want like anybody to say that about me because it's definitely not true. Um, and I've like luckily been able to like kind of hide in the back of the locker room here at the high school to change. But I feel like if we had a more um, like open dialogue with gym teachers, like I had male gym teachers mostly in freshman year, and I didn't feel comfortable going up to them and being like, "Hi, um, I'm LGBT, and <laughs> like I'm having problems in the locker room." So I feel like having a more open conversation about LGBT kids in general in the locker room would be really great because we just want to change. It's we just want to change in peace. <laughs> so yeah, I think that would be really helpful too to maybe add something into the policy about bathrooms and locker rooms. Thank you so much for making the time to come out and speaking so boldly <laughs> for, for everyone. You know what? If I'm tired tomorrow in first period AP history, I'm going to show Mr. Sawyer this. <laughs> yeah. so, but On it's Hiller Day tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes. I, I know it's Hiller Day, but uh, as a teenager, 8.15 still early. <laughs> I understand. Yes. It is, so it is great to have student voices here, though, so yeah. so appreciate you coming out for policy. This is my second uh, school committee meeting, so... <laughs> well, I hope many more to come. <laughs> well, it's Me too. great to hear that, that, that the process actually that you experience yes. is reflected in the yes. policy. That's always the hope, um, but, you know, that's where it's great to have someone who's, who can speak directly to that, because yeah. we think it should work this way, we think it works this way, but if it doesn't actually work this way, it's good to know. Yeah. So. And we should probably explain to you the process. So what will happen now is we'll take it back to the policy subcommittee. We'll revise it according to the feedback you've given us. And then it will go back out again to the community. So it will go to, you know, all of the students who get our emails, all of the faculty, all the parents. And so you'll have an opportunity to take a look at it as it's mm -hmm. revised. And we would love your feedback again. Yeah. If you have it um, and you want me to send it to other trans students that we know, we can definitely do that too without outing them or anything like that so they can have feedback too. Great. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And, uh, you. you know, you can always email us too, although great. we'd love to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank, you. Thank, you so so thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> Dr. Kavna, I have one question on this policy. It's about um, the reference procedures. The last paragraph speaks to the reference procedures. Oh, so I. I think what I thought about that, and Jen, you can help me out with that, Go ahead, yeah. is from that second paragraph where it talks about that uh, a supportive strategic plan to address legal and social emotional issues will be developed by a team of school personnel who are familiar with the student. Um, and when it says the team may include school administrative counselors and school nurse, I think we will need to add faculty to that based on the, what we learned here tonight um, but there are also in some of these references here and you know Amanda I know that you read through them as well but there's an awful lot of information that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education gives us about um, the ways in which we should go about supporting students who are um, gender nonconforming or um, trans so are these all um, referenced here in the document Right. I don't see those. So perhaps that's something to look at. Sure. We in can the next that to make it clearer. And next time around, I will be there as well. Sure. Thank you. Any other comments on this particular policy? No, but uh, I appreciate this coming forward from the from you guys. And, and really, Carol, yeah, Dr. Kavanaugh was the impetus yeah. for this after she attended that meeting at Tech, which was great. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was good feedback from that meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, policy JRD publication of student photographs and images. Let's 
So the origins of this one, I believe, Dr. Zaleski had come to me and said, you know, we were looking at policies about publication of student photographs. And what we realize is that we have a policy that runs the school year and covers every kid in the Hopkinton Public Schools, but there is nothing in particular to ESY. And we looked at the policies and said, hmm, you're right. So then the other thing that we did was we looked at MASC because they very often have policies that will help us. And MASC has a policy JRD that's about three sentences long, literally three sentences. So we found it interesting that Hopkinton even had this policy in the first place. Um, so what we did was we sent this policy off to legal counsel and they brought it back and they had two different policies, one that said ESY and had all of the language you see here and one that had the regular school year and had all of the language that you see there. So when Jen and I met, we thought it really doesn't make sense to have JRD and JRD1 or JRDD or something so that we are taking the regular school year in ESY and putting them into two different documents. If we could sort of seamlessly take all of the information that legal counsel gave us and marry it into a district without changing any of it, into a, a document, it would make a whole lot better sense, which is how we went about the process. And I know that we've received a lot of feedback on this. Um, one of the things that you know parents should know is that in the same thing that we just told the two students that this is really an iter iter iterative process that when you give us feedback on it, we take it sort of back to the drawing room and work on the composition a little bit. So a couple of the things that were brought up for us. Um, one of the things that I would worry about and our legal counsel worried about, people had suggested that it would be a very good idea for ESY to be an automatic opt out unless somebody writes and says, I don't mind having my child, you know, sort of be in, in photographs. Um, the issue with that is that um, the legal counsel said when you start to set up a set of rules for gen ed kids or all kids and then you set up a room uh, a set of rules for students on IEPs you are really setting up an inequity and years down the road I understand that parents may feel this way today but someone reading this policy two years from now three years from now would say that 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 would be discriminatory like why is it that we want to sort of conceal or not bring forth photographs of students with special needs so that was a big concern for him the the inequity in the two policies um, the second thing Thing that people said and this one actually makes sense to me uh, when we use the word public domain public domain appears or the phrase public domain actually does appear in our original policy and the way it appears in there is it says um, the policy policy shall not limit the right to publish photographs of any student participating in school sports, school plays or concerts, or other activities in the public domain. And public domain is weird there. Like I know what the policy is getting at. What it's saying is that if you're a basketball player on the Hopkinton High School basketball team and you go over to Holliston and you play a game and somebody takes a picture of you and you end up on the Metro OS Daily News front page, we can't control that because that's in the public domain. So that's sort of the meaning of that right there. Um, but I, I kind of get the, our reading of it, I think, when we were in the room was that if we have, you know, a field trip, say, for example, where we take ESY kids off to Canopy Lake Park, and, you know, a park executive has a camera and takes a picture and then puts it in their shiny brochure and you happen to see a student there with special needs. We had no control over the fact that he was in a public place or she was in a public place and somebody took a photograph and used it, right? So that was sort of my reading of it. In subsequent conversations with the attorneys, what they've said is, yeah, public domain is a weird phrase to use because often what happens when we say public domain is that we're talking about things like artwork. So that painting was done before 1723. Therefore, it's, you know, in the public domain. You can make copies of it. You can use it freely. So it's a weird term to use. I also get, and parents brought this up, that if we're taking pictures of kids in ESY and then we say, oh, here's student X and we see him participating in this activity at ESY, 
What's happening then is people know that ESY is a program for students with special needs, so implicitly we're saying that this particular student is identified as having special needs. So I will agree with people that some kind of language would need to be added to this policy to be able to say that if you're going to identify a student and identify that student as a member of or a participant of ESY, then what you're really doing is saying that the student has special needs and you can't do that. Right. So the policy does need some work. So I'm curious why ESY is called out, I guess, is for that reason alone, really, is that I think the concern that I have heard is, is like you said, people not wanting kids to be identified as having special needs unless they so choose, that, that that's information that should be controlled by the child and the family, obviously. So the way I'm reading the policy is that, and you explaining it, is really kids who are in ESY are being held at the same essentially policy is everybody else that if your you know photograph is taken out you know whatever and ends up published somewhere the school doesn't have control over that any more than they do a basketball photo or right well I think else. that's why we got to that funny place of why would we have a separate policy for ESY except for the fact that ESY happens after the regular school year right. so there was a, a timing issue if what FERPA tells us is that at the beginning of the school year, every kid is supposed to get some kind of notification, whether it comes on paper or it comes electronically, saying you have the right to opt out of any published photographs. So if you don't want your child photographed, bulletin boards, anything in our schools, then just you know fill this out and send it in to us, and you have to have a very solid time frame. Like we gave it to you on September 1st, so two weeks from then on Friday afternoon at the close of business. I mean, a lot of policies will give you that kind of level of detail. That said, if you wake up on Saturday morning and you say, oh, I forgot to fill out that thing and I really want to do it, you can do it at any moment in time. You can do it the next day. You can do it six weeks from then. You can do it. Something happens to you in December and you're like, I don't want my kid's picture out there anymore. January, you can take do that. So, but that's, that's what FERPA says is, the way you go about that through the entire school year, but we realized we had nothing covering ESY. So the ESY language would be calendar different in that when we start to put together the ESY program and we say to parents in April, you know, we, if you don't want your child photographed at ESY, this is the time frame you have as long as you get it back to us by June 1st, June 15th, June 30th, whatever, is perfectly fine because ESY doesn't start before that amount of time. Um, I, I would never want to violate the rights of children with special needs. So if people are feeling like this isn't appropriate, we're happy to work with them, but we also have to take FERPA into consideration. And I know they have to. And I would like to recognize member of CPAC. Would you like to come join us? Uh, sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Rob, are you thinking, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> You. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for everyone. And I'm Robin Malone. I'm the secretary of the CPAC. Thank you for waiting patiently and joining. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I was part of the, the online discussion, and um, it did seem that there was some confusion around the second paragraph, um, which I think, you know, I understand it a little bit more clearly now. Um, and then, you know, there was a lot of discussion around check this box for yes and check this box for no. Um, some parents had the um, um, the opinion that there should just be one box to to opt in, but the default should be always that you know the that that you know if you don't fill fill in the form or you don't um, get it back in time that you that you automatically opt out. So um, that's pretty much. That, that's as far as we got in the discussion. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of opinions, um, um, and I thought it was a very productive discussion. Um, personally, I don't know um, how everybody else felt about it, but that's that was my take on it. Um, I, th I thought that it was very respectful and, and productive, and I think that, you know, obviously everybody wants everybody's opinion honored. I personally, you know, have two children who are nonverbal, um, who can't come home and tell me about their day. And I was there during the SY a lot. I was doing a lot of the parent-led activities, and I saw how much fun these kids were having, how much work um, and dedication the teachers 
and the administration have and, and, the, and what they do for our kids. And it was pretty amazing. And I think that a picture says a thousand words and to share those pictures of kids having fun at the Y, swimming at the Y, like there's a great picture of my youngest who has Down syndrome and the, the aide is holding him up like this and he has the biggest smile on his face and he's at the pool, you know, and having just a great time. And I think that's what we all want for our kids is to have as much of a typical experience as possible. A lot of kids, typical kids get to go to summer camp and I know ESY is not summer camp and I'm not trying to suggest that at all, but it's nice to see them having, you know, some, some typical experiences and having some fun. The parent-led activities were a lot of fun, too. It was a big hit with kids. You know, they got to do some planting activities and water acti we got to, We went outside and did a big water activity fun day, and they got to run through sprinklers and things like that. So that's really, and it was, to, you know, we were... Um, we showed the pictures at the September um, CPAC meeting, September 17th CPAC meeting. That's really what the intent of the pictures is. Um, so, yeah, that, um, and I guess we're just trying to figure out a way that we can satisfy all parents and make all parents happy with the policy. Um, the parents like me who do want their children's faces shown, and, you know, I, I, and I really do want that because, you know, if I'm not there, like if I wasn't there all summer, I wouldn't know how much fun they're actually having because like I said they're nonverbal so they don't they can't come home and tell me oh we went to the Y today and we went swimming and it was so much fun um, so I want to see those pictures but of course I completely understand and you know want to honor those parents that don't I completely understand that so I think there's a way that we can figure this out it seems like it's um, it, it's definitely doable yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah that's sort of where uh, the conclusion that we came to yeah, and maybe another thing the parents weren't aware of, I think, you know, some parents might have had the impression that we would be putting, you know, kids' pictures into bright, shiny brochures. And realistically, we use them only for that first meeting in September for CPAC. It's kind of a nice kickoff to show what kids did all summer, you know, so. That was definitely, um, I think, a big question is where are these going yes. to be used? How are they going to be stored? If they're going to be stored, if they're going to be um, deleted properly, um, according to FERPA, I didn't know that there was a, a procedure in place according to FERPA, but there, um, the, that has to be, like those electronic images have to be deleted and, and removed, you know, at some point after I think several years, somebody has to go through and make sure that those are no longer part of the record so that, you know, um, the images can't be found later in, on, on the web or something like that. Um, yeah, so that was definitely a concern. But I think if, if parents understood what the pictures were going to be used for, in what context, in what, you know, uh, where, you know, it's not going to be on a brochure that's going to be, you know, a printed thing that's going to be out in the public. It really is just for other um, um, special education parents in a CPAC meeting um, on a slideshow to show that they had a great summer. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Yes. And, you know, so we say that we just really use them internally, and we do just use them internally. Absolutely. And we don't do anything other than that with them. Um, my only other concern, and we will look at that language that says public domain because it's, it's weird language, but if we are taking children with us to the Y, or, you know, we have no control over the pictures other people take, and I think it's important to point that out to CPAC parents. Yes. I think if you, like, the way that you just explained it made perfect sense to me, because obviously, like, that, we are all kind of in the public domain. There's, there's cameras yeah. everywhere. Of course. And, um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense that, you know, you can't control everything. Um, right. No, but I think in the public domain, you're probably not going to, and I, this is not what we're doing either, and I think in the policy it would be good to clarify it's not being labeled as this is a special education program wouldn't be, you wouldn't see if somebody picked up a photo of one of our students, they wouldn't put it in the Metro West Daily News or any publication to say, this is a special education student or identify them in that way. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? I think my sense from the online conversation was there were concerns about students being identified in ways that might out them as special education students where there right. are many families that choose to keep that information private for a variety of reasons. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you very much. Uh, and, you know, in the interest of time, it seems like we are going to do another round here. 
right? And sure. we're going to look at some of the languages. Certainly, looking at all the commentary that we received, I felt like there's a lot of validity there of some of the concerns, and it's important that those are addressed. And all the things that you have highlighted, I think, point to that. So I think another round is needed. I just want to quickly uh, read uh, some commentary from our CPAC liaison, uh, Meg Tyler. She, uh, you know, she couldn't join us today, but she said, I was pleased to receive all the well-informed emails from parents who were concerned about the policy and potential violations of FERPA. I respect their perspectives, and I'm eager to bring their thinking to bear on a policy decision-making. Um, does that... Does anyone else want to quickly say something, or we, uh, should we bring this back? No, only how valuable the community input is on, on all of our policies. This policy has been such a treat tonight to have actual community feedback. Yes. And, you know, because you know we do our best, but you, it really is the community's policy at 100%. the end of the day. So yeah. to hear from the community about um, how they what they're seeing as possible glitches or things that don't reflect our procedures or whatever. It's just so valuable. So I would encourage people to continue to speak up as these policies get circulated during the year as we review different policies. It's so helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ex excellent. Very well said. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, for doing all the work. A lot of back and forth, a lot of reading. Yeah. And a no, lot of analysis, I would yes. imagine. Right. Okay. Uh, moving on to item C under new business, musical instrument gift approval. Dr. Kavno. Sure. So we ha actually have three of those, and I think that uh, I was talking with Mr. Hay. Uh, he had said, oh, thank you for the blog post. And he had been working on it very closely with me, of course. Um, but he said since the blog post, he got three new instruments. So here they are, <laughs> which is really a nice byproduct, I think. Uh, so the first one, I am... Uh, requesting and recommending that you approve a violin donation valued at $500 um, and a Ludwig Bell kit valued at $250 from the Grabmayer family for um, the Hawkinson High School Public Schools Instrumental Music Program. I'm looking for a motion. So moved. I'll second. Great. A motion by Amanda, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. I am an aye as well. That's unanimous. Thank it's you. So passes. And so I would also request and recommend that the school committee approve the, it's a flute with a funny tagged on it name, um, valued at $700 from the Harrow family for the Hopkinton Public Schools Instrumental Music Program. So moved. Second. Motion by Amanda, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. I'm a yes as well. So. So it passes. Okay. Moving on. And the last one, again, is um, another flute. And I'm requesting and recommending that you approve um, that flute in the amount of $700 from the Rector family for the Hopkinson Public Schools Instrumental Music Program. So moved. Second. Motion by Amanda, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes, I'm a yes as well. Thank you. And so I know it that carries. Mr. Hay thanks you. Great. Yes. Um, and all of the instruments that we have received to date are actually in students' hands. Oh, so that's, that's a really nice thing. And he many, many thanks to all these families' generous donations. Yeah. Such a fabulous program. It is. Mm. Okay. Uh, moving on to old business, liaison roles. Dr. Kavno, I shared that um, with you a little bit uh, yeah, into the I meeting. Would. We're bringing this back just for a vote. The only change that ha uh, has to be made here is our decision in conversation with Amanda about the CCG, that only one liaison person should be sufficient. So it'll be me for this year. Um, and with that change, I would seek a motion for approval. I had also said I wanted, I don't know if you want to put this in there or not, but we had discussed I want to take on, we had talked about the 360 degree mm -hmm. view of the school committee. I would like to take that on as a lead. I don't know if anyone's interested in joining me or not, um, but to get the information to bring a proposal forward for sometime possibly in January. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Nancy, would you want to explore that a little bit? And, you know, typically what we have done is that's what I was thinking, that you're going to explore that a little yeah. bit and bring back as to what, uh, you know, the group or the team, yeah. the task force would do. And then we can add that. Is that fair? So, okay, I, I guess I was, in terms of what we were going to do, I was thinking kind of what we discussed at the 
with regard to our goals. Right, right, right. No, so yeah, I understand no. that. Please do, please do work on it because I think uh, yeah, you know I you brought think, an yeah. idea forward, which I think there was some interest in understanding that a little bit. All I'm suggesting is that um, before we put something on the liaison roles or subcommittees, just an understanding of the goal of that subcommittee or the task force that'll just help bring that forward. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. We can talk about it. Okay. I don't okay. know that it needs to be part of this. I don't, but I'm, yes, I'm yes. not clear what, because I'm talking specific to the goals, what else oh, you're looking oh, for. Oh, I see, I see, I see. No, I thought because it has come up in conversation with the liaison piece that I, if well, it's going to be in this, or are you seeing that as something? I was goals? just both, really, but it doesn't have to be on there. I just wanted more of the committee's acceptance that it okay. that that, be that, that we're going to yeah that it be explored sure i am absolutely uh, in support of exploration of that uh, for me one of the things um, is that for people to understand the work of the committee i think there is generally a gap there sometimes uh, in terms of the community understanding to what extent we are able to do things where our um, but what our purview is and you know what is under Dr. Cabano and her team's purview. So I think that's also a big part of the 360 degree review is that if people say, you're not taking care of this, well, we're not responsible for it, right? So I think there's the educational element of what our role is, which is tied to that. So I welcome the idea that that's something we want to explore. Um, so I look forward to your work. I, I do, and I don't know. I oh, think yeah, I second that. That's great. Do it. Yes. Okay. Um, so back to this particular list, what we are looking to do is as it's listed right now, with that minor change, I would be looking to close this. However, as you start exploring the uh, purpose and the breadth yeah. of it and if even if you have a few sentences or a few things okay. that you want to share and bring that back we can add that okay. um, so with that said um, I'm looking for a motion to accept the liaison roles with that change on the CCG part so moved a yeah. second sure I, I don't do we need to vote on it but I'll yeah. vote on it for you if right. you want to I, I know I, <laughs> I mean I feel like it's just a, I, a thing I but. agree with you and you know we had this conversation at the agenda planning and I didn't think that we needed to vote uh, but you know uh, Nancy reminded me that we have typically voted okay. so we brought it back sure okay. all right then I will second it thank you vote on it. all yeah. those in favor aye. yes I am I am I as well so that passes um, items by consensus Dr. Cavanaugh Okay, as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the, follow the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. Looking for a motion for approval? So, the, unless there are any. Okay, great. Okay, no, no concerns. Excellent. Sure, so moved. Thank you. Second. second. Uh, motion by Jen and a second by Nancy. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so it carries. Adjournment. We did pretty all right, I think, Nancy. Not bad. Right? See, Not bad. It was the knocking on wood that was <laughs> So, looking for a motion for adjournment. Sorry, so moved. Thank you. And a second. second. A motion by Amanda, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, I'm a yes as well. And so we are adjourned. Our next uh, regular meeting will be on October 17th, right here at the high school library at 7 p.m. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>